Oh, please do sit down. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all uh, well. Uh, just like to say at the start, we're uh, talking about marriage this morning. I'm not up here because uh, I am now an expert uh, in marriage or achieved some kind of sort of elevated status in marriage. If, uh, if that was the case, I was disavowed of that yesterday afternoon. Uh, we were heading out to Les and uh, uh, Kathy's wedding, and uh, in my normal way, I was exasperating poor Caroline by being ready just on time. Picking up my usual coat I was going to wear, I was gently reminded that that may not be appropriate for uh, a wedding, attired in a suit and tie, um, and that maybe I should consider wearing my, uh, the posh coat that I used to uh, wear to work when I went up to the city a year ago. This also was playing into an area in which I exasperate my poor wife, which is that I don't always put things away where they can be found. So I'm desperately thinking, where have I put this posh coat? Searching around the house, I seem to think, I've put it in someone else's wardrobe. It didn't fit in mine. I look around everywhere to see where this could be. Having not found it, I'm left with only one alternative, which is to confess. Uh, rather schoolboy era, I also, in that confession, made slight light of it by saying it doesn't matter. Not a good idea. What is going to happen next? Well, I'm rather surprised to hear a sort of a sheepish voice from downstairs say to me, um, actually, I think I might be wearing your coat. <laughs> we are not yet a well-oiled machine uh, in marriage. Just wanted to say as well, um, we're focusing uh, this morning on marriage. So uh, if you are not married, uh, you have been married, or you, uh, you're single, or you're uh, single and you long to be married. We, uh, we are looking at that subject and that aspect of humanity, particularly uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, we're also going to look today at the subject of marriage, rather than um, particularly what it is like to be married and what we should be like, uh, male and female in the home. Again, later on in this uh, humanity series, uh, we're going to be looking at that together. But before we come to look at marriage, let's uh, bow our heads and uh, ask for the Lord's help as uh, we consider uh, his word and his ways. Lord God, we come here this morning because of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come here this morning because you have first called us to come here to know salvation in Christ and to uh, follow him all of our days. And so we pray that as we look at this great subject of marriage and your purpose, uh, for marriage, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted in our eyes, that we would see something new of him and be in wonder at his love for us. And Lord, that that would inspire us in all we do, not least uh, in our marriages and the way in which we regard human marriages. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, you probably know that marriage as an institution is uh, under attack uh, in our age and our culture in a way maybe it has never been before. We have those who are openly hostile to the idea of marriage. They don't go out and say, actually, marriage is bad, we should ban marriage. No, they try and undermine marriage. They say that marriage is just a social construct. It's something that each uh, culture and each uh, generation needs to mold and change from learning from the past and mold to its own ways. Their narrative Go something along the lines of the, uh, the biblical way of marriage. Well, that's just, you know, for the old days. And actually, even in the old days, it was a way that was used by men to abuse women, uh, to oppress women, and to exclude those who maybe uh, were uh, LGBT. And so they say marriage needs to be redefined. And of course, in our country now, marriage has been redefined in the law and in the statute. So it really looks quite different from the biblical concept of marriage. Others, of course, in our society seek to marginalize marriage. They say marriage is just one option that you can enjoy uh, for enjoying sexual intimacy and for bringing up children. This group believes that the biblical marriage principles of sexual faithfulness in particular are actually denying them and constricting their freedom. The narrative says something on the lines of, uh, I know what I feel and, and sex feels good, so... Why not have sex as often as possible with as many people as possible? I don't want to be restricted by this idea of, uh, of marriage and lifelong commitment. And yet, as marriage moves further and further from uh, what God intended it to do in the way it functions in our society, it's maybe no surprise that we find marriage and indeed our society in, in crisis as a result. Here are some statistics from the British Social Attitude Survey in 2013, almost two-thirds of people believe that sex outside marriage is not wrong 
at all. That is an all-time high. Only 40% of people agree that people who want to have children ought to get married. That figure was 70% in 1989. 50% of children are now born outside marriage. Only 50% of children reach the age of 16 living with two parents. That means there are 2.5 million children in the UK living in single parent homes. Record numbers of 45 to 64 year olds are now living alone. And add to that the explosion in the availability of and the addiction to pornography. It all testifies to a society that believes the easy thrill of casual sex or self-stimulation is far more rewarding than the hard relational work of marital faithfulness and love. So this morning, I want to look at what the Bible has to say marriage really is. And hopefully, as we go through this, we'll see very clearly that marriage is part of a much bigger story, the true story that gives marriage not just meaning and purpose, but a real weight of glory. So if you could open uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2, we're going to start there in that uh, passage that uh, Steve read for us. So we looked at this, uh, if you were here last week, in detail uh, with Graham. We're going to have time to uh, skim through that and pick out some principles uh, for marriage this morning. But if you didn't hear that sermon, can I encourage you to uh, log on to the website and listen to that this week. What do we see from here in Genesis 2? Well, first of all, we see from the very fact that marriage is is referred to and defined in Genesis chapter 2, that marriage is defined by God at the creation of the world. That means it isn't a social construct. It isn't something that's to be changed by societies over time. It is in the very fabric of creation defined by God. So I need to uh, clip on here. Excuse me a minute. So marriage is part of creation's design. Marriage is also created to be between a man and a woman. Back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we saw that God created male and female. He created them. We see that uh, in Genesis chapter 2, there's this one flesh relationship. It is between Adam and Eve, two complements, as we saw last week. Not two of the same. Marriage Defined there at creation is to be between one man and one woman. We also see there in Genesis that marriage is an intimate, lifelong relationship. A man will leave the loyal family ties there in Genesis chapter 24 of his parental home. And instead, he will unite himself in a new family unit with his wife. Yes, we're to honor our parents But if we're married, there's a new bond that we must learn. We must learn to set aside the old bond and take on this new unity, this intimate one flesh unity uh, with our husband or wife. We see as well in Genesis uh, 2 that sex is for marriage only. It is from the union of husband and wife in marriage. This one relationship is formed and it's out of that, one of the ways that that works out in the physical sense is sexual union. Sex comes as a result of the formation of the one flesh union, not before. We also see in Genesis 2 that marriage is created for glory and not for shame. It's a rather strange verse there, isn't it? In verse 25, uh, right at the end, where he talks about Adam and Eve were both naked, but they felt no shame. See in the Bible, uh, covering up, is associated with shame, but here very clearly marriage is not a thing of shame. Sex within marriage is to be celebrated and enjoyed. It's not something to be ashamed of in marriage. So we see marriage is part of creation, and of course creation itself is a big story, isn't it? But creation is part of a bigger story, a part of a bigger story of what God is doing in human history throughout time. So turn on, if you will, to uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 here, we find we're moving on to the story of redemption, to God's work 
in redemption. If you're uh, familiar with the big story of the Bible from start to end, you'll know quite often we divide that uh, the work of God in human history into three phases. There's creation, there's then of course the fall when things go wrong, but God coming in and acting as redemption, paying a price so that the effects of the fall can be put right and reversed. And then there's a future element of what God will do, and God has said he will do, uh, in restoration in the future. So after creation, we found in Genesis 3 came the fall. Adam and Eve's relationship with God was broken because they didn't trust God and his goodness and his ways. And one of the results of that, amongst other things, was that male-female relationships would be characterized by conflict and struggle. We come to marriage, we need to uh, realize and recognize that we come to marriage as fallen and broken people. If we don't do that, we're going to struggle as we seek to be married and in close relationship with someone else who is broken and fallen. We need to recognize that we are fallen. We have all inherited sin from Adam and Eve, and we're all affected by that, uh, those of us that are married in our marriages as well. What is the biggest story? What is the biggest story that we're looking at here? Well, actually, in Ephesians 5, there are two important relationships going on here in this passage in Ephesians 5. First of all, there is the relationship between Christ and his church, between God and his people. And then secondly, there's the relationship between husband and wife. I don't know if you notice, but these are just completely interwoven with each other, aren't they, in, the, in Ephesians 5? Almost so much that Paul at the end has to clarify which one he's talking about when he says, no, this profound mystery, I'm talking about Christ and the church here. These are so, stories are so interwoven in how we're to understand them. But just to help us to work through that this morning, what I'm going to do is go through Ephesians 5 first and look at what it has to tell us about the relationship between Christ and the church. And then we're going to come back and look through it again to see what are the implications of that for the relationship of husband and wife. So, we look at the relationship of Christ and the church. Look there in verse 23. What do we see about the relationship of Christ with the church? Well, we see it's an intimate unity between Christ and the church. Christ and the church relate to one another as a head relates to a body, as parts, different parts of the body relate to one another so close is that unity. For Christians, the Bible tells us that that when we become Christians, our faith in Jesus Christ brings us into a close and intimate relationship with him, an extraordinary spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ himself that is as close in relationship as the parts of our body are in relationship to one another. It's a relationship that all our hopes and longings, married or not married, point towards. The relationship between Christ and the church is an extraordinarily intimate uh, unity. You also find that the relationship with Christ and the church is based on Christ's passionate love for the church, so much so that he gives himself for her. Look there in verse 25. What does Christ the head do for the church? What does Christ the head do for you and me if we're Christians? Well, in verse 25, he gives himself in love. In verse 26, he gives himself in love. See, Christ's love for the church was a passionate love. If you read through the Gospels, you'll, you'll see that in the way that it works out. In John chapter 17, the Lord Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven. He's praying particularly, first of all, for his disciples who were there with him at the time. But then he's also praying for those who would believe in him and become Christians as a result of their testimony and their message. And he prays to the Father like this. He says, I have given them, these people, to come, the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Christ's love for the church, that's Christ's love for us, if we're Christians, is a passionate love. And it's so passionate that it then works itself out in self-sacrifice for the object of his love. 
see that, don't we, in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus contemplating what he is going to do sacrificially for the church, is driven to literally sweat tears of blood. Christ gave himself for his beloved church the best that he could give. He gave himself, he died under the wrath of God in her place, so that united with her in his death, his beloved church would no longer be under God's wrath and separated from the love of God. Christ passionately loved the church, and he gave himself for her. You see also in Ephesians 5, Christ's exclusive devotion to the church. What is the purpose of Christ's extraordinary love? We go to see that as we move on to the next few verses. Verse 26, we find that he gave himself to make her, his church, holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word. That word holy there means uh, a set apart. Christ has picked specially this group of people, this church, to set them apart specially for his love in order that they may be cleansed and washed with water through the word. See, his his love for the church is directed to one purpose. His love for us as Christians is directed to one purpose, to wash us of the stains that damage us of sin, to wash us from the shame, to wash us from the guilt, to wash us from all those things we carry around as a result of inheriting Adam's sin. And he does that through his word as we hear and respond to his word. Christ's love for the church is extraordinarily passionate and it's faithful and exclusive. We find that it is for a particular goal that Christ is doing all of this. His goal for the church in verse 27 is to make her radiant and beautiful. See, the glorious goal there in verse 27, is to present the church as a radiant bride to himself at this great day in the future that is coming when the new heavens and the new earth start and the great opening ceremony will be a celebration of Christ's love for his church. What will be we? That's if we are Christians as members of that church be like on that great day. Well, we will be radiant and glorious because that is what Christ is doing for his church. That is what Christ is doing for us now. In verse 27, we'll be without stain. We'll be unaffected by the scars and sin. We'll be without wrinkles, the effect of death, and aging will be reversed and completely removed. Think of the most beautiful bride you've ever seen. Multiply that by an infinite number of times. That is what Christ is preparing his church for for that final day, and he will delight in what he has made us. And so in verse 29, what does he do in the present? He feeds and he nurtures his church. He provides what his church needs now to flourish and to be ready for that glorious day that is to come. Christian, you and I are part of of this church, whether we're male, female, married, single, whatever our situation and context in life, if we're a Christian, we are part of this church upon whom Christ has lavished such love. This is how much Christ has loved us. This is what Christ has secured for us. And this is why we willingly follow him and submit to him in our lives. I'll just pause for a minute and ask you if you're here this morning and you are not yet a Christian, don't you want to be part of this amazing story, this amazing story of Christ's love for his church and where that's all heading? It's not an exclusive club. The Bible very clearly says all who call on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. Can I gently ask you this morning, what is stopping you committing to this Jesus Christ? What is it in life 
that you just feel could be just so much more valuable than being part of this great love story of Christ and his church. For the rest of our time together, I just want to focus on the implications for marriage and especially uh, marriage involving Christians. Clear implication here is so intertwined is the uh, story of husband and wife and marriage with Christ's love uh, for his church. The implication is clear. Marriages should reflect the reality of Christ's big love story for his church. I say reflect uh, rather than maybe illustrate. Because unlike a, an illustration, a reflection is, is linked directly to its source. Yes, there might be ripples, it's a bit distorted, it's not quite the original thing, but it is linked directly to its source. If we are Christians involved in marriages, we are first and foremost linked to the source that is Christ and linked to his love for his church before we are linked to one another, man and wife, in marriage. But what are uh, the specific implications uh, for Christian marriage then, looking through uh, from Ephesians? As you say, the big principle is that marriages and Christian marriages above all should reflect the love of Christ for his church. See, seeing marriage as a reflection of Jesus' love for his church uh, reinforces uh, what we know from Genesis chapter 2. See, one man... And one woman, why? Because it reinforces, because it is about the complementary nature of the love of Christ for his church. Lifelong faithfulness, because it images this love of Christ for his church. Sex for marriage only, as a physical intimacy of, of a sexual relationship, reflects the deep and mysterious spiritual intimacy that Christ has with his church in the physical realm. And actually, it helps us with just one reason why a Christian should not consider marrying a non-Christian. This is to be a reflection of Christ's relationship and devotion to the church. And if you haven't got that objective together, that's a very hard thing in marriage. But Ephesians also has some specific implications for marriage. Let's go and look through uh, chapter 5, those verses again, with a focus this time on the implications for the relationship between husband and wife. So firstly, our relationship, if we're married with our husband and wife, is governed first and foremost by a mutual submission to Christ. Let's look there in verse 21, right at the start of these verses. We're told, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The source there is our reverence for Christ, and we submit, husband submits to, wife, to, uh, to Christ, wife submits to Christ in marriage. But as we go on, the way in which husband and wife are to submit to Christ in marriage should be uh, shown in a complementary rather than a symmetrical way. The way that a wife submits to Christ in marriage is, is to look different, or at least the primary focus of it is to look different from the primary focus of a husband's uh, uh, submission to Christ in marriage. And so we see that as we go on in verse 22, a wife in particular is to submit to her husband in marriage as an expression of her submission to Christ. I just want to note here, actually, the word that uh, is used here, it's helpfully uh, translated differently here in our NIVs from the, uh, the passage that's going to come next in chapter 6 when Paul is talking about the relationship between uh, slaves and masters and indeed between parents and children. This word here has a voluntary element to it. It's uh, well translated, submit yourselves. It is a choice, a voluntary yielding, a submission that the wife chooses to do. If you're here uh, with your uh, husband at the moment, I just want you to have a, just a little glance to the side of you if he's sitting next to you. Just, just take a little glance at him now. Just reflect on what a fine physical specimen he truly is. 
Reflect on how he is sensitive to your every need, even before you know it yourself. Reflect on how those little habits, they're just so endearing, aren't they? Aren't they lovely? And reflect on how clean and tidy he always is and how he just smells great. Yeah, I'm about to have something thrown at me from the back row, I can tell. (laughs) This, of course, isn't true, is it? Submission to somebody who is unworthy uh, would be a devaluing thing. But wives don't submit to husbands because of the worth of the husband himself. Wives are called to submit to their husbands because of the worth of Jesus Christ. The worth of Jesus Christ who has, always lo- who has already loved them in such a passionate and exclusive and devoted way as they are members of his church. A husband should never take it for granted when his wife chooses to submit to him. When she does that, she is choosing to submit to Christ, and that is a thing of great worth and beauty. She's doing it for Christ. Just one at this point to, uh, as an aside note, that Scripture contains some exceptions where submitting to Christ does not means submitting to a husband. We're told in Scripture that adultery breaks the marriage covenant. You are not required to submit to an adulterer, although Scripture does say that you may choose to do so for the sake of Christ. Similarly, abuse, including some forms of repeated verbal abuse and neglect, also break the marriage covenant. I think if there's one thing we've learned from many stories in the press recently is the extent of abuse of men continuing to abuse women that we hear of in the public sphere. We should not take this for granted. If you're a victim of these, it is vital that you speak to a Christian that you trust so that you can be helped and counseled and guided and cared and loved for. A wife is to submit to a husband in marriage as she does unto the Lord as an act of reverence to her Savior and lover Jesus Christ. And how is a husband to focus his submission to Christ in marriage in a different way? Well, a husband's focus there in verse 26 to reflect Christ in the way he loves his wife is to love her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Submission is, uh, is a hard thing. Well, the standard here to love your wife as Christ loves the church is enormous. Christ loved the church passionately. We saw that, didn't we, in his passion going to the cross. Husband can't reflect Christ if he allows himself to be cold and distant when the relationship gets hard. After all, Christ loved the church while we were still sinners. Christ's love is self-sacrificial. That means a husband to replicate that is to put his wife's interests above, at least alongside his own. Of course, a husband won't replicate Christ once and for all, sacrifice upon the cross. But Ephesians here does help us, doesn't it, in how a husband is to imitate Christ's love as he can. Look at verse 26 to 27. The goal of a husband's wife it's to, it's for his, uh, the goal of a husband's love for his wife is to cooperate with Christ's work through his word, to cleanse you both from sin, ready for the great wedding day that is to come. In verse 25, loving your wife involves treating what is important to her in the same way as what is important to your own body. And that means feeding and caring, feeding, providing what is necessary for growth, caring, looking after, and making sure she is well protected and cared for, so that she indeed may flourish as part of Christ's bigger story. I'm conscious, uh, as I say these things, that for uh, some, you're married to uh, somebody who isn't uh, a Christian. And that is going to bring big challenges sorry, big challenges 
when you don't share the same view and high view of what marriage is. But I can say this. You are still part of God's bigger story. You are still part of God's church, the church on which Christ has lavished his love. And you can still reflect that with honor and honor your Savior as you seek to take your part in marriage, even if, rather painfully, that is not reciprocated. Husbands should love their wives. Wives should submit to their husbands out of reverence for Christ. And then just finally, we notice from these verses that it's, uh, it's a unity. The reflection of Christ in his church is a unity likened to being part of the same body, isn't it? And so it should be with husbands and wives, not us, not unto her and me anymore, but us. Our marriages, were, our marriages are reflected, created to reflect the image of Christ, the intimate union of Christ with his church. It's not my favorite phrase when people introduce their partner as their better half. But there is an element of that, actually, that is helpful, isn't it? We're not complete as husband or wife without the other one. We're now a whole, not two individuals. You cannot reflect Christ and the church in marriage if you're content to live two ostensibly separate lives as two different individuals. Our time uh, is running out. We've uh, only been able to do this morning uh, an overview of marriage. But I recognize that in the fallenness of this world and uh, the seeking of relationship between broken people in this intimate way, there will in this room be uh, many cases of deep hurt and pain. And I'm sorry if I haven't been able to go into uh, any detail of that and practicalities for uh, working through that. We do uh, as Steve said, have some time in uh, community groups this week. And um, if that is you and uh, you want to talk a little bit more uh, as a result of what's been said this morning, then please do uh, come and find me afterwards. As we close, let's say there's much more that we could say, but I'd like us to finish with this, really. We should all be filled with hope and optimism when we think of biblical marriage. We're not only compelled by being part of Christ's love story, to love one another as uh, Christ loved the church. We're also, being part of Christ's big love story, empowered to do that. We're empowered for the hard work of relational marriages uh, and relationships within marriages that are being redeemed. We're empowered to confess our sin, knowing that is what we've done with Christ in order, as part of our process of being united with him. We're empowered to forgive and to be forgiven just as we have first received the forgiveness of Christ for our sins and his love for us. And above all, we are given a great and a wonderful hope for marriage. Marriage is a reflection that points to a greater reality that we will all be part of. Whether we're part of a great marriage now, whether we're part of a difficult marriage now, whether we're part of a broken marriage now, or not even married. We're all being prepared for that great day in the future when the church will be fully united with her Christ and that will be the visible reality that we'll be part of for all eternity. We should have great hope for our marriages, whatever form they are taking at the moment. And I just wanted to say as well, I think just on my heart, there are a number here I know who, uh, for whom marriage is a struggle at the moment because there are physical uh, limitations and maybe mental limitations as well of one partner or another. And considering some of the ways in which we're to imitate Christ and the church may just seem, well, how can that just be possible in the situation in which I find myself? My mind was drawn to actually our Savior, Jesus Christ. Where was Christ's glory and his love for the church most profoundly shown? Well, it was shown on the cross in his moment of greatest weakness. In Christ's redeeming mercy, there is opportunity in the face of great weakness to model a love of Christ for his church in the way that you are within your marriages, even against all of those. I'm so encouraged by those of you whom I see seeking to do that. And uh, please continue to do that as you encourage us all, younger people uh, in marriage, to follow after Christ and to uh, reflect this great love story of Christ for his church in our marriages. Well, let's 
have a few moments to reflect as the other uh, band comes back up, maybe to reflect on the depth and the enormity of Christ's love for his church that we're part of if we're Christians, and if we're married, on some of the implications of that for our relationship, husband and wife.